Okay, so I've added a poem up here, and I think I'm gonna read it. It's got a little bit of a link to philosophy, but it's like I, I was sort of feeling like because I go through stages of like impulsivity where I do slightly stupid things, but it's not it's not like megaly bad. It's just like I'll be like, oh, I feel like drinking, so I'll have a drink binge, or I'll just like I don't know. I just decided to start smoking, so I did that. And yeah, so I decided to try and express that uh, using I guess, linguistic art in the form of poetry. And so I'm going to read it. And yeah, so it's, it's not like an amazing piece of work, but you know, it's just, it's just an expression of a way of life or something that I feel like most people will be able to relate to in one way or another. So yeah, uh, I do that which I know to be wrong, it doesn't help me, I need to sing a more positive song, it's not always easy to do the right thing, but this is the song I know I need to sing, I can rewrite the story and create a better narrative, predicating my framework on Kant's categorical imperative, treating other people as ends in themselves. Would I want my actions to be carried out by anyone else? So that's what I did. Um, so it starts out with a problem. And then the most of it is the solution. And the bit that I say is doing wrong is because I was questioning, like, what exactly is wrong? What makes an action wrong? And at the time I was contemplating whether or not to have a cigarette. And I ended up having one in the end, but I also ended up concluding that I was wrong. But I went around that. It's like I had the initial feeling that I shouldn't do it. Actually, I had the initial feeling that I wanted to do it. And then my mind sort of said, well, why do you want to do that? You know that smoking kills. You know that it's not good for you in the long term or the short term. Um, yet you still want to do it. Um, but part of me knew it was wrong. And... I often know that things are wrong, or maybe wrong is not the right right word, but certainly not right. Um, so maybe not wrong, but not right. Uh, so, and this, this doesn't just apply to smoking, it applies to anything really, well you could apply it to anything, or maybe you could only apply it to the, that, that which is actually wrong. So, and but what makes things wrong? So, <laughs> and that, that's sort of what I was trying to figure out. and. Um, I think we know, I think we know when we shouldn't be doing something because there's something like a voice inside us and we could call it our conscience that says, you know, you shouldn't be doing this, don't do it. And maybe it manifests as that sort of thought, which is easy, easy to interpret. Or maybe it's more of a feeling, like a gut feeling, like it's it, your mind doesn't actually say in the form of a thought that you shouldn't be doing this, rather thinking about doing the thing or actually doing the thing, mate induce some sort of negative emotion within you and I think that seems to be a good measure of, of um, deriving morality but it's not necessarily I don't I don't know if it fits into the category of morality um, because morality generally concerns other people however a lot of the things we do don't just affect ourselves they also affect other people so maybe morality is the right way to um, address this or categorize this sort of thinking um so so let's say is smoking smoking is bad for your health but your health and your condition doesn't just affect you if you're in a bad condition that's going to negatively impact emotionally on the people around you because well it's going to put them in a bad mood like if if, if someone you know someone who's close to you like a family member or a close friend um has to watch you with cancer that's not a good thing therefore smoking is wrong um it's not just bad it's it's also wrong because it's it's morally abhorrent in that it, it does in that if the effects in which it induces also induce negative impact on those around you so so we know what's wrong to a certain degree but 
is there a degree of subjectivity in that or is that an objective truth? Now, we can argue that smoking or drinking is wrong subjectively in that it's not necessarily wrong independently from the human experience. But then again, the human experience is all that we're really having because life is phenomenological. We can't escape the confines of our minds and our experience. So maybe we need to change our definitions of subjectivity and objectivity. When we say something's objectively wrong, maybe we're not talking about it in the sense that it's objectively wrong independently of the human experience, but it's objectively wrong in that anyone who smokes is committing a wrong act, an objectively wrong act, um, because because of the reasons I've already gone into, like the way in which it affects those around you. Um, so it's objectively wrong in that sense, but not object, perhaps not objectively wrong in the sense of of a, of a macro scale. It's not like the universe has has got this law writ- written into it, which says that smoking is wrong. Although perhaps that is the case. Maybe that's part of the logos. You shouldn't smoke. But I don't. I don't think it's necessarily um, the rule of smoking which is wrong. I think it's more like. Well, I guess we're going to link to Aquinas's primary precepts. Um, it's so smoking is wrong. You you ought not to smoke. It's more of a secondary precept, in that it's derived from a primary precepts, and the primary precepts are essentially in line with the logos, because well the primary precepts are just objectively true, according to Aquinas, uh, and according to the teachings of the Catholic Church. However, the secondary precepts of which we derive from those primary precepts are perhaps ambiguous, so. Maybe secondary precepts are um, subjective, but does subjectivity mean it's arbitrary, or does it mean that it doesn't necessarily have any meaning? Um, I don't know, because like I've already said, our whole life is subjective. Um, For the most part, we can't, even when we're perceiving things objectively, we're still perceiving that objectivity from a subjective lens. So it's pretty impossible for us to actually be objective um, about things. But, yeah, so I I was, so this whole sort of thought process was induced by a feeling that I had that I shouldn't be doing that which I am doing. And I just sort sort of took a step back and tried to try to question exactly what was going on under the surface. Um, what what exactly was the underpinning of this belief um, that smoking is wrong and that I ought not to do it? What What's causing me to think that? Uh, and what makes it wrong? And that's exactly what I was thinking about. Um, see, I don't know if morality is objective. And like I've said, it, it does depend on your definitions because objectivity can be ambiguous. Because, like I've said, I keep saying like I've said, but um, objectivity could apply to, could could be used in the context of talking about large groups of people. That would be objective if something is, if something seems to be, um, if there seems to be some sort of coherency within the data or the results of a large group of people, then you could refer to that as being objective. Then again, you could talk about uh, the independence of human experience. Like, so for example, the physical laws. Um, gravity is objective in that it exists independently from the human experience. Whether people are there or not, gravity is going to be there. Um, and we know that because when we're not in the room, um, chairs and, and, and furniture doesn't go floating, floating around. It, it, it stays grounded no matter what. And well, we can assume that anyway because we don't know how things behave when they're not being watched. But I think, um, and and that's obviously the, um, what's it called the the problem Hume's problem of induction. Um, just because we perceive something about the world doesn't necessarily mean that it's necessarily true, even if we see coherency because we don't know how things. Will, will act if, if we're not there and we can't necessarily predict future events but but yeah um, 
So I don't know. I don't. I don't know. And oh, okay. We, and we could say that something's wrong. So let's assume smoking is morally wrong. Uh, what exactly says that we shouldn't do that which is wrong? What what rule is in place to say that we shouldn't do wrong acts? Because it's one thing it's one thing to say that something is wrong, but it's another thing to say that you should do what is right, or you should avoid doing that which is wrong. And again, we can link to Aquinas and the Cinderesis rule. He says, "Do good, avoid evil." Um, and it, it seems to be the case that we know what evil is, and we know what good is, and. It seems almost self-evident that doing what is good is better than doing what is evil. But why is that? What makes something good and what makes something evil? Is it just that it preserves well-being? Because, well, that's what smoking seems to be about. Um, if you're not smoking, then if you, if you abstain from smoking or you quit smoking, then it seems to be the case that you're attempting to preserve well-being of your well-being and also maintain the well-being of others so that they don't have to witness your suffering um but what makes well-being good why why would we assume that well-being was good and this is like one of the problems with sam harris's argument he says morality is determined by that which promotes well-being he says what is good is well-being but why is well-being good and, and then you've got to take an even further step back and look at the b picture even, even, I don't know, I guess look at the bigger picture. Because can you just have self-evident goodness? I don't, I don't know. We just, we just seem to know what's right and we seem to know what is wrong. I think I think I'm happy in saying that that is objective, but I don't know. I feel like Aquinas was sort of right with his primary and secondary precepts. However, I don't think secondary precepts are necessarily self-evident. I think maybe the primary precepts are objective, but then again we can say that the primary precepts aren't even objective in every sense of the word. Or yeah, because maybe morality is slightly relativistic in that it does depend on certain situations. However, there does seem to be coherency in in that which we report to be right and that which we report to be wrong. Um, but there is there is that subjective overlay that we can't necessarily escape from. So. We can't necessarily say something is always right or something is always wrong because we're having different experiences and maybe in different situations different moral rules apply and that may mean that something is which is usually wrong for, for the most part can sometimes be considered right and I guess that links sort of to Bonhoeffer because well Bonhoeffer was a 20th century philosopher and theologian I believe um, he converted to Christianity, and he was um, in 1933 when Hitler came into power as the Chancellor of Germany. Um, Bonhoeffer started to see that Hitler wasn't necessarily acting in a godly manner, because obviously he was trying to exterminate Jews and create his his master race, and I think this was influenced by um, Nietzsche's Will to Power, which he didn't actually even publish. It was published by his... Um, either cousin or sister who was a Nazi and yeah so Nietzsche wouldn't, wasn't really happy about publishing that book but it happened after his death and anyway so Hitler started doing all this like really bad things like like killing Jews and just putting people in concentration camps and, and Bonhoeffer felt conflicted between his duty to the church and his um, I mean his duty to the state and his duty to God and um, he thought well and, and we can back this up with the work of Jesus Christ. Jesus wouldn't have been in favour of that which Hitler was doing. Bonhoeffer felt as though, as a good Christian, he had to walk, walk, walk the same life as Jesus, or walk a similar life to Jesus and follow Christ. 
and this meant him plotting to assassinate Hitler. Now we could argue, without any context, that plotting to assassinate um, the leader of your country is wrong, well, and that seemed almost self-evident. But then, if we if we take um, the context into account, that changes. It's like, well, Hitler was doing all these bad things, and maybe sometimes you have to do a bad thing in order to prevent other bad things from happening. And and Joseph Fletcher actually described the dropping of the atom bomb at the end of, I think it was the Cold War, but I'm not sure, so don't quote me on that. Um, he said that that was the most loving thing to do. And obviously it doesn't, it, maybe it doesn't sound great to use those two words um, in the same sentence. Um, especially when when one of them is applied to the other, so you can't really say that dropping an atom bomb is loving. Um, maybe you could argue that it was the right thing to do in that situation, um, because it was for a greater good. It it would to prevent the war. Um, however, the war could have ended on its own. But anyway, my point is that um, context does have to be taken into account when we're making moral decisions, because actions aren't necessarily independently good or bad and maybe we can say that they aren't independently good or bad because actions are pragmatic there's something that takes place within a series of events you never just have an action you have an action in context so context is necessary and that's sort of like Wittgenstein's ideas um that you you need to that words only have meanings within context and obviously that's more about language but um it we can we can expand that out um because well everything everything occurs within a context so you can't just take take an action completely out of all contexts and determine whether it's right or wrong because it, it that life's not like that life is contextual so so, in that sense, morality is relativistic, but perhaps it's not so relativistic because we can say, well, if that context is repeated, or if a similar context or a similar series of events or state of affairs reoccurs, then perhaps you would come to the same moral conclusion. Because to assume, well, it, it doesn't make sense to say that there is one universal... Um, moral law in accordance with any given action because there is no one universal common situation there is no one universal context there are multiple contexts and um so we have to take because because with the former if we, if there was one universal um common context if everything was just in one simple context that's almost reducing life that's that's reducing life down to something it's not and you can't derive a moral rule from um from a false assumption about life about the nature of reality because your moral rule should be in alignment or in accordance with the nature of reality because like i've just said morality is uh, pragmatic it's got to apply to situations and if situations alter then we almost have to um, look at that situation relativistically and then determine a moral rule. However, that doesn't necessarily mean that there isn't an underlying set of principles which which we can then apply to each situation and then determine that moral rule. It doesn't necessarily mean it's completely relative. It doesn't mean that anything and everything can be, term can be uh, perceived to be good or right. However, arguably, <laughs> arguably it sort of does... It does lead us to think that anything can be right or good. However, that thing which is right or good is dependent on the situation. Um, but if that situation replays itself, then it's good. It's not like you can take um, a situation like me sat on the sofa right now making this YouTube video. I couldn't just say, oh, well, right now it's right for me to um, go and... I was going to say go kill my whole family, but that's really morbid, but I'll use it anyway. Um, it's not right for me to say that right now, because even even if morality is relativistic, 
Like I could attempt to justify that, but then that's probably going to include me making up some sort of fan fantasized situation or context within my mind, which gives me good justification to do that. However, if that situation which I made up in my mind, like for example, if I if I had good reason to believe, um, or if this was actually the case that my family were all com that were my family were all planning on on blowing up the city tomorrow, then maybe I would have good reason to do that. Um, however, that's not the case. So, um, morality is not completely relativistic. Um, it's just within w within a certain series of events, you have a certain set of of moral principles that the that you can then apply to that situation. But it's not it's not arbitrary. Um, it's it's still meaningful in a sense, and still slightly objective because had that situation occurred anywhere in the world, perhaps you could come to the same moral conclusion. And also, I don't think it would be right for me to go and kill my whole family if I thought they were going to blow up the city tomorrow, or if they actually were going to go blow up the city tomorrow, because the most moral thing to do would be for me to call the authorities. And obviously, this is completely hypothetical, just to um, put that out there. So, I don't know. I think, I think I've explained my views enough, but I don't feel like I've got there. I've I've only got 20 minutes of recording time left and I don't want this to be a mega long video because I've heard that people aren't too fond of watching those sorts of videos. However, it is an interesting topic. Morality is an interesting topic and it all started with a poem. I don't know if Kant's categorical imperative is right, but it does seem right. Like, most ethical theories seem to be trying to attempt to ex extract the underlying metaphysical um, moral presuppositions or propositions which underpin um, our actions um, or underpin us determining whether something is moral or not. So the categorical imperative is essentially made up of three maxims and these maxims seem indisputable. However, they can be applied situationally and when applied situationally, we can come to different moral conclusions. So, the first, the first um, maxim in Kant's categorical imperative is to act on a maxim of which you would will to be a universal law. Now, this seems pretty general. It's like it's sort of like Aquinas' primary precepts again. It's it's general. It's a general rule, and then you put you apply that into a specific context because, like I've said, life isn't simple. There's not one whole complex. Uh, one whole context which applies to everything. There are multiple different contexts which make up the whole of life and those contexts are possibly infinite. Um, but you apply that um, more rule of act acting as a... act only on that maximum of which you would will to be a universal law. You apply that, or you apply different situations, um, you apply that maximum to different situations and then you derive more conclusions than that. And just because that is an objective um, framework, it doesn't necessarily mean that you always come to the same conclusion, and that is due to the complexity of different contexts. Um, but just because you come to different uh, conclusions doesn't necessarily mean that um, the framework is wrong, because because I think that is I think people will inevitably come to different conclusions because we're all experiencing a different, a different context and we have different perceptions. So I'm going to conclude by saying that in a way morality is objective. However, the rules of which we derive from these objective moral rules, and we could we could call this the logos or, or the primary precepts or uh, the categorical imperative, um, the rules which we derive from those, so secondary precepts, for example, are subjective in that they are contingent on the context. They are dependent on the context. Um, so, yeah. However, I think, I think I'm leaning more towards morality being objective. However, it depends. On, it turns on how you define the words and, again. And I'm, I'm going to stop this recording right now because... I could probably talk about this for hours, which is a good thing, because it's it's interesting, but 
yeah, anyway, um, thank you for watching, I guess.